Two-factor authentication schemes definitely help to mitigate many of the risks of password theft. For example, a password that might be stolen in a data breach or a phishing attack or even something like a keystroke logger. But I think there is a common misconception that two-factor authentication can be used to solve all problems related to, to password theft. And I, I definitely want to stress that you know, two-factor tokens, while they do have value, they're far from a panacea especially when it concerns overall password theft. And one particular class of malware that pretty much handily defeats the security measures that are associated with uh, two-factor tokens is what we call the session hijacking trojan. And, and by the way, another term here that is also that you also see is, is the session riding trojan as well. Session riding trojan or session hijacking trojan. And basically, you know, what are these types of Trojans? So imagine you, you have a computer system somewhere. Okay, and let's say it's, it's someone's laptop and they're going to use that laptop to connect to their bank account. All right, so here's their laptop and they want to use it to connect to their bank account. Now, the session hiding Trojan, as you might imagine, it's a Trojan, so it's a piece of malware that is kind of sitting on that machine and, and obviously unbeknownst to the user, it's just sitting there. And it's kind of waiting. And what's going to happen is, let's say that the user decides they want to log into their bank account. So here's, here's their bank, okay, and let's say that their, uh, their bank has a website, and the user uh, goes to their bank's website, and uh, you know when they go to their bank's website, they're going to be presented with the typical uh, credential uh, inputting form. So for example, a form to enter in a username and a password. Uh, and, and maybe even a two-factor token and other things. So usually what's going to happen is, is the user is going to basically go ahead and they're going to enter in. So imagine you've got, you've got a legitimate user here, okay? And the user is going to go ahead, he's going to type in these pieces of information, and he's going to go ahead and, and establish a connection uh, with this bank account, okay? He's going to enter in the username, his password, uh, a token, anything you, you can imagine the user wanted to enter, all right? Now what the session writing or session hijacking Trojan is going to do is once the user logs in, it's basically going to be monitoring for the user to log in. Once the user logs in, this Trojan is basically going to piggyback on the existing session, okay, and then start conducting fraudulent transactions on top of that session, okay. Now they basically waited for the user to log in and establish the session, then they're going to basically piggyback on that session. And maybe another way to think about it, what they're effectively doing is they're they're hijacking the session, which is why we call these session hijacking trojans. They're, they're kind of riding on top of the session. So you can see where the, the nomenclature came from. Now, the really scary thing about these session riding trojans is that they work even in the presence of two-factor authentication schemes. All right? Uh, and the reason for that is that they've already waited for the user to log in. Okay, so even if the user had a token, if, if this user um, had a two-factor token and the two-factor token displayed a value on it, Okay, and the user entered this value into the field here. Um, you know, it doesn't matter that the hijacking Trojan is going to basically ride on that particular session. All right, and and moreover, I think it's important to point out that you know that, that even though tokens are one way to implement two-factor authentication, session writing Trojans or session hijacking Trojans, you know, they aren't hindered by different variations or implementations of two-factor authentication. Uh, for example, you know, they can be used to defeat hardware tokens, they can be used to defeat software tokens, they can be used to defeat um, SMS tokens or paper-based tokens or grid-based tokens and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now even if the transaction is encrypted or authenticated over SSL, I mean, none of this really matters because they're, they're riding on top of a session that already exists. So in other words, they can pretty much defeat um, pretty much any imaginable variation on an existing standard authentication scheme that's out there. Okay. And hopefully having kind of you know, don't sound like a broken record, but really the, the ultimate reason for that is they basically rely on the user to log in first. And so the, the user kind of solves the authentication problem for the malware. And then once the authentication is done, then they basically surreptitiously co-opt the remainder of the session. Okay? There are a few examples, I think a few case studies I can mention of session hijacking trojans that are out there. I think the, the most common one is, is one that's known as Zeus. Okay, Zeus is a banking trojan. It's one of the most popular ones out there, and it's certainly among the most frequently ones seen in the wild. And Zeus basically monitors a user's web activity, and as soon as a user logs into their bank's website, even if they use two-factor tokens, Zeus basically makes these surreptitious transactions in the same session 
And, and during those transactions, it silently withdraws funds from the victim's bank account. Okay. Another example is SpyEye. Uh, and SpyEye is very much similar to Zeus in, in how it siphons off funds from the victim's bank account, but it, it's another uh, variation out there. There's one called CACBOT, or QUACKBOT, depending on your pronunciation. And, and this one basically injects itself into popular Windows processes. It'll actually hook uh, Windows APIs to monitor a user's activity. And then QuackBot will write on top of any session that a user created with their financial institution. Again, even if two-factor authentication was employed. Uh, finally, there's this one particularly nefarious session hijacking trojan known as Tatanga. Tatanga. Now, what Tatanga is, you know, does is it basically it not only circumvents two-factor authentication, but it also hides its own tracks. I'm going to kind of write that down, hides its tracks. And, and by that, I mean it, it literally um, tries to make itself invisible, even from the user's perspective. Okay, it, it, in particular, what happens is if is once um, Tatanga transfers any funds, it actually dynamically rewrites the account balance page to present the original balance back to the end user. So imagine you, know, you, you had a balance, let's say you had a balance of $1,000, Okay, before Tatanga, let's say, withdraws all thousand dollars, so really now your balance is going to be uh, is going to be zero. But Tatanga is going to basically rewrite the, th the zero back to a thousand. And so what you're going to see when you're the user is still going to see thousand, even though in reality his bank balance is going to be zero. Okay. And I think this particular one is just, it's just unbelievably nefarious. But but really the main lesson here, maybe a, a broader lesson from a security perspective, is that. Any security measure that you place at a higher level cannot be used to solve a security problem that's been introduced at a lower level. Okay? Once a system has become compromised and malware has been placed on it, when you have a system that's been compromised down here and there's malware on it, anything you do downstream, any security measure you place downstream, like if you put a two-factor token, really a two-factor token is, is operating kind of at this level. It's not actually operating at the level of the, the, the physical system. It's actually operating at the, at the transport level, if you will, or the, the level at which the user is connecting and creating a session with their bank account. All right? And so all bets are going to be off about whatever security measures you place downstream. So I think, again, I'm going to just emphasize that once more, that a security measure placed at a higher level, you just cannot use it to solve uh, any kind of security problem that was introduced at a lower level.